Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you for your wonderful gift of salvation, for the blood of your Son that cleanses us from all sin, for the power of his resurrection that bestows eternal life upon us from him who conquered death and who conquered sin. Thank you, Lord God, for the eternal truth of your word. Speak to us now by your spirit through your word, for the praise of your glory and the edification of your people and the salvation of the lost. In the name of the one who saved us, your son, the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yesterday was the Jewish Feast of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Etmol uh, haya Yom Kippur in Hebrew. Yom Kippur comes from the word kapora, kapora, a blood sacrifice, but the meaning, the root meaning of kapora is interesting. It means cover, cover. In the Old Covenant, a Jew who had real faith and real repentance, if their repentance was sincere and they had a genuine faith in God on the basis of his word, the blood of the scapegoats, of the sacrificed animals, would cover their sin until the Messiah came and removed it. It was a temporary provision. They had a kapora until Jesus came and removed it. The goats and the high priests were told in Hebrews were types of Christ. He would come and remove it, but they had a temporary cover, sort of like a temporary insurance note until your actual policy comes. You're okay to drive, but it's not what you're waiting for, or a temporary driver's license from the Motor Vehicles Authority. You, they'll give you that, but you're waiting for the real one to come in the mail, in the post. Well, it's sort of like that. That has how Old Testament salvation worked. They were saved by the same blood of Jesus as we are, but they had a temporary provision until he could save them, if that makes any sense. Kapara, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And once a year, the Aaronic High Priest would enter the Holy of Holies and go before the Holy Ark, sprinkling the blood of one of the two scapegoats. The goats were identical in size, age, and appearance. And chosen by casting lots, one would be for the Lord and the other would be the Ezazel, the scapegoat, the Se'er Ezazel, the scapegoat. One a picture of the Lord, the other of the devil. One would die so one could go free. There's a double typology in it, some people say. But the one that was chosen for the Lord would be sacrificed in Jerusalem, and it would be that blood that would go with the high priest on back of the curtain once a year into the Holy of Holies. When John the Baptist was conceived, his father, Zechariah, was the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, and that's what he was doing. It was Yom Kippur. So based on that, we can calculate the birth date of John the Baptist approximately. Okay, and some people have tried to, from that, extrapolate the birth date of Jesus, but it doesn't work. But John the Baptist, you have, you have what to work with. That was the Day of Atonement. That was yesterday. Uh, and so the high priest would do it with these goats. These goats would be paraded through the streets of Jerusalem in a procession. And the people would spit on the goats and kick them and throw rocks at them and curse them for their sin and abuse the goats. One would be sacrificed then and the other taken to the wilderness and at first they released it, but later on after one came back, they pushed it off a cliff. They took it a distance of 90 stadia, grabbed it by its horns and they threw it off a cliff. It died after the first one. The first one for the Lord was sacrificed in Jerusalem, the other outside of Jerusalem and had to be killed by thrown off a cliff. Understand? We all talk about the blood of the lamb. As the Catholics say, Agnus Dei Quitoris Peccato Mundi. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But we're also saved by the blood of the goat. Our high priest, Jesus, corresponding to the goat that was for the Lord, brings his own blood into the Holy of Holies, making it a way for us to be united to God. That is why when he died on the cross, the temple veil was torn from the ceiling to the floor, 
sinful man was no longer separated from holy God because in heaven, our high priest, Jesus, of whom the Old Testament Aaronic high priest was a symbol, entered on our behalf and brought the perfect sacrifice. No more kapora. Now it was not just covered, the sin was removed. The lamb takes away. So you were saved by the blood of the lamb, was saved by the blood of the goat. Why is there two? Well, we talk about this on the typology of the Hebrew calendars, the Hebrew holy days. One of my books out there, and we have several books, but one of them is The Final Words of Jesus in Satan's Lies Today, and I explain the typology of the Hebrew feast in it. Remember in Luke 4, when Jesus went to Nazareth and to his hometown, and they tried to throw him off the cliff? Well, they couldn't do it. Why? They had the wrong goat, you understand? <laughs> That was the Azazel, the goat that corresponded to Satan. They tried to say he was evil and push him off a cliff. They had the wrong goat. He was the other goat, or the other goat was a picture of him. That's why they couldn't throw him off the cliff. They had the wrong goat. He, he had to die in Jerusalem, okay? <laughs> it was the goat who goes off the cliff outside of Jerusalem. Now, there's more to it than this. I'm giving you a very condensed version. I'm leaving most of it out. but. You've got the basic idea, I, I, I would hope. Well, anyway, that was Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement yesterday. We always interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of Jesus. But before we do that, can you turn with me, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 15. We'll begin, please, in verse 10. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two, and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, speaking of Egypt, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, that is Egypt, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It came about when the sun had set, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the two pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. To make a covenant in Hebrew is lachtoch brit, to cut a covenant. You sacrificed animals and bisected them, two halves of the carcass, and both parties had to walk through the middle of the bisected carcasses. That's how you signed the contract. Both had to go through. Now notice only what we call in Hebrew the shalhevet yah, the flame of Yahweh went through. Abraham didn't. God knew from the beginning, and he's speaking in the context of Abraham's descendants, that God would keep the covenant, but Israel would not. You understand? The validity of a covenant, however, never depends on the unfaithfulness of man, but only on the faithfulness of God. So the Shalhevet Yah, the flame of Yahweh, just like the Shekinah, the pillar of fire, went through, but Abraham didn't. Now, I just mentioned this in passing. When the birds came and he chased them, and a great darkness came. That corresponds to Matthew 24, where the body is, the eagles will gather, the birds of prey will gather. It corresponds to that, but I only mention that in passing. There's a deep eschatological aspect to this passage. Be that as it may, then there's much more to this passage that I'm saying. That's how they did it. 
There had to be a death. Both parties had to pass through the middle. Each half of the carcass represented the death of one of the parties. You understand? There had to be this death. We have to die to make the covenant. It's a blood covenant. And it goes beyond your own life, your own life in this world. Okay, that's why the death had to be there, because there had to be something that would go beyond your life in this world. Well, how do we interpret this? Well, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, and let's understand what the New Testament says about the Day of Atonement. We'll begin in verse 11, please. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, actually, let's begin in verse uh, 6. Now, when these things have been prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second only, that's the Holy of Holies, or the Kodesh Kodeshim, where the ark was, the priest enters once a year, yesterday, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. If you can follow what it's saying, this relates to 70 AD. The existing temple had to be destroyed for the church to emerge as the new temple. But again, I only mention that in passing, which is a symbol of the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. In other words, the literal temple was a reflection of the one in heaven. The veil that separated the people from God is what separated us from God. Every Yom Kippur, they'd make the sacrifice until Christ came. He'd come and make the perfect sacrifice and take away the sin. He'd fulfill the meaning of Yom Kippur. Now, Yom Kippur still has a future meaning, the judgment of Satan. Only one goat has died. The other still has to die. When Jesus comes back, Satan will be destroyed. Okay, there's a future prophetic meaning for Yom Kippur. Okay. Now let's look. Eternal redemption. Now this is one of the passages that completely dismisses the Roman Catholic claims of the Mass, that Christ has to die repeatedly and sacrificially. When Christ entered the Holy of Holies as the perfect sacrifice as our high priest, that didn't have to be daily sacrifice for sin anymore. There didn't even have to be Yom Kippur anymore. He did it once and for all, eternally. Remember, Roman Catholicism fundamentally denies and rejects the gospel of salvation. Roman Catholicism, with the doctrine of the Mass, which is an abomination, it is idolatry and cannibalism, is a fundamental rejection of the gospel of salvation. It denies his sacrifice was complete and sufficient for all time. It also denies that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. You have to atone for your own in purgatory. Remember, no matter anyone tells you, Roman Catholicism is a complete rejection of the true gospel. Do we have any ex-Catholics here? Anybody used to be a Catholic? Do any of you disagree with what I've said? No. If you want to know what Catholicism is, ask somebody saved out of it. Don't trust anybody else. Let's look. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleaning of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place, a death 
for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now pay attention to verse 16. For where a covenant is, there must be a necessity, of necessity, be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. That is why God had to become a man. He had to die as a man in our place. A man had to die. But there's two halves of the carcasses. Two men have to die for the covenant to be valid. Let's read on into the next chapter. Remember, there's no chapter divisions in the original canon. Verse 26. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. In other words, there was one there to begin with, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. The old nature must die for the new covenant to be effective. I was a cocaine addict. I injected cocaine. I sniffed cocaine. To this day on an x-ray, you'll see a distorted nasal septum from cocaine abuse. I injected cocaine. I was crazy. There's only one reason. I'm not either dead or addicted to cocaine or dead from it because Jesus saved me. No, I'm not a recovering cocaine addict. That poor loser is dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. Somebody had to die. I don't smoke cigarettes, I don't smoke pot, I don't sleep with anybody but my wife. Why? I've done, done all those things. Why? Because he's dead. Amen. Now that's not to say I don't get tempted, it's not to say I don't drop my cross, we do. But if we continue, in Greek it is an ongoing action, if you continue to live immorally, the sacrifice doesn't work for you anymore. When I received the Holy Spirit, God gave me the power to stop taking drugs. Now, I had what society calls a drug problem. I didn't have any drug problem. I had a sin problem. Jesus was stronger than my addiction. Jesus is stronger than anything. To me, it was a lifestyle choice. I never would have stopped doing it. I wouldn't have even desired to, and probably couldn't. I couldn't even quit smoking cigarettes. I used to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. I couldn't even stop smoking cigarettes and reefer, let alone cocaine. Until he gave me his spirit. Yeah. Somebody's got to die. Does the old creation spring up every day? The thoughts come into my head every day, all the time. And the devil's angry. <laughs> every day, all the time. But I don't live that way anymore. For all, we do. But we don't live that way. He's dead. She's dead. This is the problem with 12-step programs. There's psychology masquerading as theology. Hello, my name is Bob. Hi, Bob! And I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hello, my name is Hazel. Hi, Hazel! And I'm a recovering compulsive gambler. My name is Jacob, and I'm not a recovering cocaine addict. That poor loser snuffed it. He died with Christ on the cross of a new creation. Their fellowship becomes based on their old sin. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I know people who were so drunk and so addicted to alcohol that God used Alcoholics Anonymous to, to get them sober. And then they got saved. But I also know people who went to hell because of Alcoholics Anonymous. It became their religion.
somebody's got to die. In order for the new covenant to work, both parties have to be dead. As I once heard Richard Wormbrand say in Israel, Richard Wormbrand was a Jewish guy who was tortured by the communists for 14 years. My wife could speak to him in Romanian and stuff. I couldn't. I spoke to him in English or Hebrew. But he, uh, he was a good preacher. And I heard him speak one time, and he said, Jesus never said, I'm going to die for your sins. He said, I'm going to die for your sins. Now get up here on this cross and die with me. <laughs> That's the problem with the crucifix. The wrong person is on it. Christ is risen. It's we who should be on it. <laughs> Somebody's got to die. If you're living according to the flesh, there no longer remains a sacrifice. Now in the context of the epistle, look at chapter 6. Verse 4, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened, they understood the gospel by the illumination of the Spirit, and tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Now, this does not mean now you're saved, now you're not. But it means an unrepentant backslider. This idea, because somebody put their hand up at a meeting and came forward, well, a lot of those people were never saved to begin with. But even if they were, they're not saved now. Unless a backslider repents, they do not have the assurance of salvation. Do I believe in one saved, always saved? Yes. Do I believe in unconditional one saved, always saved? No. If you get out of the lifeboat, I hope you're a real good swimmer. <laughs> the Lord's never going to kick you out of the boat. Now look what it says. There no longer remains a sacrifice, but then it goes on to tell us they've tasted and been partakers of the Spirit. I've actually heard some Calvinists tell me, well, they only tasted it, they didn't swallow it. <laughs> but they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. They were born again. You can't be a partaker of the Holy Spirit unless you're born again. Oh, but nobody can snatch them out of the Father's hand. Turn with me to John 10. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them. They'll never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. You've got the Father, patri, in, in, in Greek. Okay. Okay, You've got the Father. You've got the Son, Luios. Okay. You've got the thief, okay, the klepton. Okay. And you've got the sheep. The probatan. The word for snatch away there is harpezo. Same word for rapture. <laughs> Nobody can rapture. Snatch them out of my... Harpezo, the verb, is used for the klepton, not the probatan. In other words, no, Satan cannot make you fall away. He cannot make you backslide. He cannot take you away from, he can't do it. You're in the, you can't do it. He cannot hard paint so you out of the Father's hand. He can't do it. But it's talking about the klepton, the thief. 
It's not talking about the probatom, the sheep. Nobody, it doesn't say the sheep can't leave. There is a complete and utter corruption of the Greek grammar and syntax to arrive at that nonsense. There are monkey tricks and circumlocution to try to get around the plain meaning of Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. Do you believe in the perseverance of the saints? As the scripture teaches it, yes. But it has nothing to do with the Calvinistic redefinition of it. It's an eschatological term. It's a prophetic term for the end of the age, generally. It only occurs two places in scripture. Revelation 13 and Revelation 14, the only place perseverance of the saints in that sense occurs. Now we're told other places to hoop them only, to persevere, but the terms perseverance of the saints is in Revelation 13 and Revelation 14. In Revelation 13, verse 6, Sorry, verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. In verse 10, if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Continuing, no chapter divisions in the Greek. Chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the hoopamony, the perseverance of the saints the ones who resist taking the mark of the beast, the ones who don't agree with John MacArthur. That's what it means. Do I agree with perseverance of the saints? Absolutely, as the scripture defines it. But it has absolutely nothing in its context, exegetically, whatsoever to do with once saved, always saved. Nothing. That's not perseverance of the saints. That's not what the term means. What I do believe in, though, is perseverance of the saints as scripture defines it. And I believe in the perseverance of the Lord. There is a big difference. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 1, it's actually reported among you, there's immorality. An immorality of such a kind as does not even occur among the pagans, the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife, it may be his stepmother, in a sexual sense. You've become arrogant and not mourned. Notice the political correctness of the church says you're arrogant if you speak out against what's wrong. God says you're arrogant if you don't. Instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I and my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. Who are you to judge? Judge not. If the word of God says something is wrong, that's not you judging and it's not me judging. It's what God has judged. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when you're assembled as I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided, that's an interpolation, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That is the full application of one of the two meanings of binding and loosing. You go to the person, you go with witnesses, you bring it before the body, and if they persist, you bind they repent, you can lose. He gives them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. That they'll be scared to death and repent. 
I believe I've told this story once before. It is a very true story. It's more than 10 years ago now. It took place in England. Lovely Christian couple, godly people. Had a daughter, and as so often happens, the kid goes off to university. She gets on drugs. She's shacking up with her boyfriend. She's living immorally, and she will not repent. Her parents are devastated. They pray and they pray. The kid just more and more into the. She drops out of college, out of shacking up with some dude, and it gets worse and worse. And they pray and pray. Finally, this was before antiretrovirals. Mom, Dad, I have AIDS. Please pray with me. That's when AIDS was a death sentence. Better that than the alternative. The Lord does not like to save people to lose them. Their salvation costs too much. They're too valuable. He paid too high a price. He will bring judgment. As a correction into the life of that person. Rather than see them be eternally lost. One or two things are going to happen. There's no such thing as a successful backslider. Either they're going to die in their sin, or they're going to repent. But when you pray for a backslider who's unrepentant, realize it may come to a point where you have to give that person over. Now, Paul did not do this arbitrarily. If you can read the Greek, and I have explained it on other tapes, the Lord led him to do it. We cannot bind and loose arbitrarily. You can only bind what is being bound and loose what is being loosed in heaven. The Lord led him to do it. God does not like to save people, to lose them. The good shepherd leaves the 99 for the one. He will actually bring judgment into the life of that backslider to get them to repent before it's too late. This, however, is not the perseverance of the saints. It's the perseverance of the Lord. It's not the perseverance of the sheep. It's the perseverance of the shepherd. There's a big difference. What the Calvinists do is they take that which applies to the wolf and apply it to the sheep. They take that which applies to the shepherd and apply that to the sheep. Bad exegesis, to say the least. He leaves the 99 for the one. No, he doesn't give up on backsliders, but there is a point of no return. When that point is, we don't know. Remember, Samson didn't know when he lost his strength. That's the problem. Backsliders don't know at what point that happens. Now, the Lord was gracious to Samson. But it cost him his life to repent, didn't it? Oh, he died in faith. Put his hands out as a type of Christ like that when he died. He died in faith. But it didn't have to happen. Now, in the greater plan of God, God allowed for it and incorporated it into his word and things like that, for sure. But it doesn't have to happen. We will have enough problems in this life because we live in a fallen world, because we have an old nature, because other people have an old nature, and because we have an enemy, the devil. We're going to have enough problems in this life. There will also be the things where the Lord brings correction into our life. But to have to bring this heavy-handed correction, God would rather spare us that. There's enough trouble as it is. You'll have tribulation in the world, the ellipsis. That's enough. We don't need to bring more on ourselves. But backsliders will. The shepherd will go after them. They're going to fall on their face. They wind up in humiliation. 
Isaiah 30, Isaiah 31, the safety of Pharaoh will prove to, be, to, prove to your shame. Woe to those who rely on Pharaoh. When you backslide, you're trusting in this world of which Satan is the God. You're making bricks for Pharaoh. If you backslide, you're trusting in this life. What happened to Abraham when he went to Egypt? Humiliation. He wound up lying about his wife. Telling a half-truth anyway. Let another man have her sexually. You see, you cannot meet Jesus and be the same. Once somebody is born again, they're either going to be conspicuously better or conspicuously worse. A backslider will eventually, and probably sooner than later in many cases, sink to a level of moral depravity that was worse than before they knew the Lord. There is no such thing as a successful backslider. No such thing. Doesn't exist. Now remember, the Epistle of Jude tells us there are as many backsliders in the church as there are outside, but that's another issue. If a man dies, yet shall he live. Well, yeah, that's talking about the resurrection. But it's also talking about being a new creation and the old creation dying. <laughs> if a man dies, yet shall he live. We have eternal life because the old man or the old woman died. Don't dig them up. Don't disinter the corpse. See, Satan loves you to get the shovel out and go down to the graveyard. He loves it. That's this whole inner healing stuff. Go back and dig up the old hurt and the old, the abused child. They're dead. Let them be dead. Reckon them dead. But Satan raises up false teachers who are in business, most of them. They write books and stuff. Buy their book and they'll send you a free shovel. <laughs> Go dig up the stiff. No thanks. I know what a stiff looks like. I don't want to dig up a stiff. What do you want to do that for? Now let's understand this. Nobody can snatch us out of his hand. Satan cannot make anybody fall away. He cannot do it. It's impossible. He can't. But one of the things that happens at salvation is we get our free will back. Calvinism denies this. Man lost his free will because of sin. The most an unsaved person can choose is when, wow, when, where, and how they're going to sin, not if. They must sin. They're under the law of sin and death. It's like gravity. Gravity says that this has to fall. That's it. When you're a new creation, you're under a new law. When I got the Holy Spirit, I didn't have to sin. I didn't have to take cocaine or shack up with a broader lighter joint. I didn't have to do that anymore. There was something more powerful. I got my free will back. I was no longer addicted to substances. He who commits sin is slave to sin. I was no longer addicted. I had a choice now. I could have chose to smoke a joint to take a shot of coke or whatever. I could have chose to do it. Or I could choose to leave the old creation in his grave. To benefit from the new covenant, there must be death. To have life, there must be death. What to say in John, unless a seed falls to the earth and dies, it cannot live. Right? We co-die with Christ, burial and baptism. You have a process of catabolization in agricultural regeneration. An actual death occurs metabolically to the seed, 
and the germ cell sprouts into a new life. A new creation comes out very different than the old one. What does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Look at it. Verse 21, for since by a man came death by a man, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, in Christ all be made alive. In God's economy, remember, there's two generic men. When you're born, you're born of Adam, fallen nature. When you're born again, you're in Christ, part of the body of Christ. <laughs> there's only two men. The old nature is of Adam. The new creation is of Christ. But for the new one to exist, the old one must die. Okay. And he, and he says, what are you asking what it's going to be like? You know, well, it's sown as a perishable body in verse 42, but it's raised up imperishable. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. Okay. If there is a natural body, there's a spiritual one. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The corpse that will go into the earth unless the rapture happens will bear no resemblance to the glorified body coming out. They didn't even know who Jesus was when they walked with him on the road to Emmaus at first. Okay. A flower looks very different than a seed. <laughs> it must fall to the earth and die. The seed must fall to the earth and die for the new creation. There must be death. A man believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Now that's climaxed in the resurrection, absolutely. But it's a daily truth. Pick up your cross and follow me every day. Every day. Every day. Now look, you know, I'm, I'm old and, older and plumper. When I was younger, when I was away from my wife, I used to get tempted and stuff like this. I never had an affair or anything. But I certainly was tempted. But I had to keep the old creation in the grave. We even get a new name in the Book of Life. We even get a new name. You don't want to name the new creation after the dead one. And so it goes. Now, some people obviously have the name revealed, like Abraham became Abraham and Saul became Paul. Some people get it revealed. But we all got one. You know, no, you're not going to be Rumpelstiltskin. Don't worry about him. I'm trying to have a new name. Well, you are eternally secure in Christ as long as you remain in Christ. You are going to live forever as long as you die today. It's that simple. Think of a life insurance policy. God will never cancel it. He will never cancel it. Unless you stop paying the premiums. <laughs> if you want to benefit from an insurance policy, you have to be a member of the insurance fund. You've got to pay into it. Well, as long as you are in Christ, you are secure. That policy's not getting canceled. You have eternal assurance. Think of superannuation. As long as you're a member of the retirement scheme, as long as you're paying into the fund, you're guaranteed your protection. 
God's not going to cancel it as long as you remain a member. But if you stop being a member, you're no longer protected. If you put on the garments of salvation, he covered me with the garments of salvation, cloaked me with the robe of righteousness. You put on the life jacket and you get in the boat, the church. He's not going to kick you out of the boat and take the life jacket from you. You're eternally secure. Keep the jacket on and sit down. Hallelujah. Keep rowing. Amen. We're bound for glory. Hallelujah. But if you take the jacket off and dive overboard, whose fault is that? You have a choice. Unsaved people don't have a choice. He who commits sin is slave to sin. I was a slave to substance abuse. I was a slave to cocaine. I was a slave to it. Everybody's enslaved to something before they get saved. But if the sun sets you free, now you shall be free indeed. Now I have a choice. And I say, no, I don't want any narcotics or any drugs unless they're medically prescribed or something. I don't want it. I want it. I had a choice. I didn't use to. Now I have a choice. You didn't used to have a choice before you got saved. Now you have a choice. Now let's understand this. We have to draw a distinction between Calvin and Calvinism. What we call Calvinism today is based on something called the Remonstrance of Dort, explained in English as a tulip, a tulip, and an acronym, a tulip. This came from somebody called Beza, one of Calvin's followers, and was put together in Holland long after Calvin had gone away. They call it the tulip. T, total depravity. Man is totally fallen. This was in part a reaction against Roman Catholicism. Thomas Aquinas wrote the Summa Theologiae and said, man has fallen, but his intellect isn't. <laughs> you, undeserved grace. Again, a reaction against Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism says grace is earned by sacraments. But then he gets into the L, not Calvin, but his followers. Limited atonement. Jesus did not die for everybody only for the predestined elect. Calvinists argue among themselves. I mean, Calvinistic scholars and theologians debate among themselves, was Calvin a Calvinist? They can't even agree among themselves if Calvin believed this. But he never taught the tulip. I... Irresistible grace. In other words, if God predestined you to go to heaven, you're going to go to heaven. You have no choice in the matter. If God predestined you to go to hell, you're going to go to hell. He created you to torture you forever. That was his purpose in making you. Now again, Calvin never said this at least not in this way, his followers did. P, perseverance of the saints. They do not mean what revelation means by it. They have their own definition. Unconditional, once saved, always saved. Well, what did Calvin teach? Calvin taught something completely different. Calvin's Calvinism had nothing to do with this in its primary meaning. Calvin's Calvinism was based on something called covenant theology. The problem with covenant theology is 
Nobody, including Calvin himself, can give you one verse in Scripture that supports it. Covenant theology, today held by Reformed churches, what Calvin actually taught, the basis of Calvinism, as Calvin taught it, was not this. It was this. God only made two covenants, not the old and new. One with Adam, one with Abraham. Well, when you read Hebrews, the emphasis is on the old covenant and the new. When you read the New Testament or even the old Jeremiah 31, it's the old. No, no. That's all subordinate. There's a covenant with Adam and a covenant with Abraham. Well, where is this? Well, it's implied. <laughs> That's what they say. This was the basis of Calvin. Now, you understand that means replacement theology. The church is Israel. They use the Deuteronomic legislation, the Old Testament, as a basis of law. This is what Calvin did in Geneva. He set up a theocratic state with a Taliban, Christian Taliban, morals police. It was a cultic comp. It was a war against all culture. Puritans did the same thing in England. They did the same thing in Salem, Massachusetts. These people, were they have a terrible, ugly history. Calvinists get very irritated when you tell them the history of Calvinism. They get very irritated when you tell them the undeniable history of Calvin. When you tell them about apartheid or slavery in the American South or the plantation period in Ireland. When you tell them about the Salem witch trials, when you tell them about the witch hunter general in England, or the teachings of John Owen and Samuel Rutherford to murder other Calvinists, to murder each other. They get very disturbed because they cannot deny it. They're sort of like Islam. You know how Islam yells Islamophobia every time you point out undeniable facts about Islam? Well, that's the way Calvinists are. Because as I said before, Calvinism and Islam are philosophically the same. To Muslims, it's Inja Allah. Everything that happens is their God's perfect will. Calvinism is the same. If somebody goes to hell, that's God's perfect will. Philosophically, Calvinism is Islamic. It is not Judeo-Christian. It is Quranic. It is not scriptural. Well, let's look at this. Did he make people to go to hell and torture them? Well, Jesus made it clear that hell was a place created for Satan and his angels. Hell was not made for people. Hell was made for the devil and for demons. It was not created for people. A God of love? would create people to torture them forever by sending them to a place he didn't even create for them? Look with me, please, to 1 Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 10. It is for this we labor and strive, because we fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men especially believers, all men, especially believers. Now, is there a distinction between believers and non-believers? Yes. But if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He's willing to save all. Now, he's God. He foreknows who's going to be saved and who isn't. But again, that's not the choice of the shepherd, of the episcopal, of the poleon. That's the choice of the probaton. Well, let's look. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 
Oh no, that just means the elect. No, it doesn't. The word electos does not appear there. The idea of a God of love creating people to torture them forever, sending them to a place that was not even made for people, is to say the least an affront to his character. In fact, it's an abomination. This is not the God of Scripture. This is the God of Islam. It's the God of Calvinism, but it's not the God of the Bible. Now understand, Calvin was reacting against Catholicism. The perseverance, as he redefined it. Catholicism was in the indulgence business. Now you're saved, now you're not. Go back to confession. Get a mass card, say a rosary, whatever it is. Buy an indulgence. No assurance of salvation. Roman Catholicism teaches the assurance of salvation as a belief is a sin. They call it the sin of presumption. The Roman Catholic Catechism will tell you that if you say, I, I'm saved and I know I'm saved by Jesus, that's the sin of presumption. Well, then how does Calvinism have the assurance? It doesn't. What a real Calvinist, a hyper-Calvinist will tell you is, your works prove it. So a Roman Catholic is doing works to get saved. They're going to the novena and whatever. They're going to this or that, you know, to the mass and whatever, and the, 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 the pilgrimage to Fatima or Lourdes or Guadalupe or whatever. They're going to, doing works to get saved. A Calvinist is doing works to try to prove to themselves they are saved. Look what I'm doing. I must be saved, right? <laughs> Neither one can give the assurance of salvation. Am I elect or am I not elect? Did he make me to go to hell forever or did he? Both of these belief systems are forms of mental illness. And both do not come from the New Testament. They both come from Augustine. Roman Catholicism and mainstream Protestantism, especially Calvinism, comes from Augustine. That's why they sprinkle babies. God knows who's elect or not. Sprinkle everybody. The church is Israel. Make baptism the equivalent of circumcision. And that's what they do. It's a disease. It's a spiritual disease. It is a theological carcinogen. God does not make people to go to hell. But without holiness, no one will see God. Now understand, there are moderate Calvinists who never went to these extremes. There are people like Charles Spurgeon and so forth who never went to these extremes. But when you read the history of moderate Calvinists, people like William Carey, he was told, sit down and shut up. If God wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your help or mine. They were against missions. Why? Because there's irresistible grace. God's going to cause them to be saved. We don't have to preach the gospel with we'll send missionaries. That's what they taught. That's what the Baptist Union actually taught. William Carey was a moderate Calvinist that went against it. Spurgeon was accused of not being a Calvinist by the extreme ones. You've got four-point Calvinists who don't believe in uh, particular redemption. They don't believe in limited atonement. There are only four points. It's pointless. <laughs> now, pay attention. I have friends, I know preachers, brethren in Christ, good men, good women, friends of mine who are moderately Calvinistic. Concerning a backslider, a Calvinist would say they were never saved to begin with. They need to be born again. They were never saved to begin with. A Wesleyan Armenian would say 
Maybe you're right. Maybe they were never born again to begin with. And they need to get born again. But if they were, they no longer are. You've got the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary. They both agree they're not saved now. <laughs> they both agree they need to repent and believe. That's the secondary. The primary, they both believe they're not saved now. They both believe that they're people who need to repent. It's only the tertiary that becomes an issue. Were they really saved or not to begin with? A Wesleyan Armenian would say maybe they were, maybe they weren't. The Calvinist would adamantly say no, they never were. You've got extremes of hyper-Arminianism that are bad. The hyper-grace teachings of Joseph Prince out of Singapore are a spiritual toxin. On the other extreme, hyper-Calvinism is a spiritual toxin. That elixir of poison is now being served in the form of lordship salvation. They automatically say that a backslider was never saved to begin with, and they need to repent and be born again. This is like Paul Washer and these guys. It's no good. Let's put these things in a spectrum. You understand Calvin's Calvinism and the Calvinism as it's taught today are two different things. Most people who say they're Calvinists believe this. Most don't believe this. There are ones who do, like the strict Presbyterians and the Hebrides in Scotland. There are ones who do, but not many. With this irresistible grace and limited atonement, Jacob Arminius said that would make God the author of sin. How can God be the author of sin? Hyper-Calvinism. These are the ones who believe not only the tulip, but they believe covenant theology, okay? Then you've got the mainstream reformed. These are the tulip people. These are the covenant people. Okay. Then you'd have moderate Calvinists. They are four point. Or they're like Charles Spurgeon. Lord, save thy elect, but please elect more. <laughs> the reformed ones and the hyper Calvinists never liked the moderate ones. Now, working back the other way, you have Pelagians.
hyper-Calvinists and Reformed people stereotypically accuse people who are not Calvinists of being Pelagians. Pelagius was a heretical monk in England in the fourth century who was opposed by Augustine, one of the few good things Augustine did. Pelagius denied original sin. Denied that an atom all die. Next to it, bordering very closely on it, is Finneyism from Charles Finney. Many people hold Finney in high regard. It is a mistake. Do not hold him in high regard. He bordered on Pelagianism. He denied original sin. The only difference was he was a sanitized version of it. He admitted everybody had sin. In order to get saved, you must be quickened. An eclanctos must take place. The Holy Spirit must put a measure of life in a corpse. I've explained this before. I'll explain it again at the end in a few minutes. Charles Finney denied original sin, but he said everybody had sin. In other words, the gospel teaches we are born with sin, therefore we must be born again. Finney just said, no, we must be born again. Well, why if he didn't have any sin? <laughs> Although it was not his intention, much of what is wrong in the modern church with cheap grace, just put your hand up and all this, this came from Finney's influence. Finneyism is the Pelagianism, what Reformed theology is to hyper-Calvinism, okay? It's pseudo-sanitized. Pelagianism. Okay. Then there is a completely different belief system, usually called Wesleyan Armenianism. This says he's the savior of all. Now remember, Calvinism is philosophy masquerading as theology. They turn the theological argument into a philosophical argument. And they say, well, if your interpretation of Timothy, if you take that literally, he's the savior of all men, if you take that literally, that means everybody is saved. <laughs> they tried to argue axiomatically, you understand? They, they used Socratic argumentation. The other thing they do is they accuse you of being a Pelagian. A Wesleyan Arminian does not deny original sin. They believe in it. Fundamentally. That is the basic spectrum. That is the basic spectrum, okay? The basic spectrum. Here is how salvation works. First of all, the doctrine of election. No place 
is anyone elect except Jesus? To be elect, you must be in him, part of the body of Christ. He's God's chosen one. Whenever the term election in the New Testament, anywhere, Ephesians 1, wherever, is used about people, it's always as a corporate entity. Israel is an elect nation, Romans 11. We are an elect people. I'm not elect, you're not elect. We are elect. If you want to be insured, you must have a policy. If you want the superannuation, you must be a member of the fund. We are elect. If you get out of the boat, you're no longer insured. Romans 11, Israel remains an elect nation and people. But individual Jews are not elect. They can be cut off from their own tree. Unless they repent, they can be drafted in again. Bum, 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 bum. Think of a corpse. A corpse is dead. You can talk to it, it's not going to answer you. If it can answer, it's not a corpse. There's no alpha brain waves. It's going to go into postmortem necrosis. It's going to disintegrate down to the bone tissue. It's dead. There's nothing you're going to say to it that's going to stimulate it to respond. It can't hear you. It can't see you. It can't anything. It's dead. It's uninhabited. The spirit and the soul are gone. It's a corpse. That is what an unsaved person is spiritually. They are dead. They have a spirit, but it's dead because they're born of Adam. When somebody is born again, a process happens that I've explained before. In Greek, eklenktos. A quickening. What is this quickening? God puts a measure, a measure of life into the corpse. He resuscitates the corpse. Actually, resuscitates is not the best word because they were born dead in their sin. But he puts a measure of life into the corpse. He makes it possible for them to hear his voice and to see the light. He gives them a measure of life, a limited capacity to interact and respond to him. When an unsaved person is being convicted of their sin when you're witnessing to them, or when they're hearing the gospel preached, or they're reading a tract, and the Holy Spirit is convicting them, that is a klinktos. God is putting a measure of life into a corpse. He gives them a little bit of free will. Enough to make a choice. I've shown you enough you can see. I've told you enough you can hear. Now choose this day whom you will serve. At that point, they must decide. At no point does what the Calvinists say happens happens. Calvinists say that God spontaneously regenerates them. Then they get faith. They say that faith follows regeneration, second birth. First you get born again, then you get faith. No, no. We're saved by grace through faith. 
If you don't have faith, you're not getting born again. Now, after you get born again, you get more faith. You get more faith. But you need faith to get saved. He puts a measure of life into the corpse. Now, if the person chooses Christ and gets born again and become a new creation, now they get their free will back. <laughs> now they no longer have to live the way they did. His spirit comes inside them. The corpse is dead. They're a new creation. <laughs> you understand? He clanked us. Buried a corpse. That's what happens in salvation. This Calvinistic lie that God regenerates people spontaneously and makes them born again because he's elected them, and then they get saved, and then they get faith. This is nonsense. And once getting their free will back to say that they have no choice but to continue to follow Jesus, this is nonsense. God gave Adam a choice. He never wanted robots. He wanted children. He wanted friends, not automatons. This whole thing is a pack of lies. When you put it in its historical context, it was reacting against medieval Catholicism. Since the church fathers, Christianity has been very good at correcting error with other error. We've explained this many times. But you don't correct error with error. You correct error with truth. Calvinism corrects error with error. It is philosophy, not true theology. It is Islamic, not Judeo-Christian. It is Quranic. It is not scriptural. A God of love does not create people to go to hell. Hell was a place made for Satan and his angels. It's such a terrible place that God became a man and was crucified so nobody would have to go there. That's the truth. The idea that he's elected you to torture you forever and that you have no, no God. What a perversion. And it is very sad that true Christians believe it. But many Calvinists are not true Christians. You see this in the American South, the Bible Belt. They get baptized when they're eight and think that, now the doctrines may be there on paper. That doesn't mean the people are born again. Look at their history and what they did. I live in Britain. With John Owen, the greatest Puritan theologian, John Owen told Cromwell, that the English Puritan Calvinists should massacre the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists. And they massacred each other to say nothing of what they did to the Catholics. What they did to each they murdered each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Murder! They're murderers! You know how many people Calvin burned in Geneva? Where did Jesus say to burn somebody who disagrees with you? And then they defended. Just like Islam, notice they behaved the same as the Muslims. They did the same thing as the Muslims. You read about Calvinist Geneva, read about Salem, Massachusetts. People were paranoid living under that regime. What they did to women and stuff, just the same as the Taliban. Same as the Mutawa in Saudi Arabia. You listen to the Iranian mullahs, they have a high view of the Calvinists, of the Puritans. Their history is an indictment. The Lord is willing to save anybody. He makes nobody to go to hell. Hell was made for Satan and his angels. There is nobody, no matter how wicked, that the Lord is not willing to forgive them if they are willing to repent. Secondly, we are eternally secure in Christ. Nobody can snatch us out of his hand. 
if we're stupid enough to climb out of his hand and go back to the world, he'll leave the 99 for the one and come after us. But at best, we're going to bring a lot of unnecessary calamity into our lives that God would rather spare us from. At best! The lifeboat won't sink and you will not get kicked out. Dive overboard <laughs> at your peril. Nobody has ever made it yet. That is the way it is. Let no one tell you differently. God bless and thank you for listening. 